Tena koto katoa. No America ho no te temetanga, ko te taita toku manga, ko waitaki toku awa, ko ototahi toku kainga inai nei, heroya toku tunga mahi o Perryfield Royers, ko Stephen mo toku ingwa, no reira nami hi kia koto katoa. Um, hey, Sue and I are here, and we are so excited to have so many people joining us um, at, at the moment of hitting record. I think we're up to 130, and I think that just shows that there's a real interest and desire to learn about what this Charities Act Amendment Bill is all about, what does it say, and also what are the steps that can be taken between now and when submission closes, which is on November the 10th. Um, but more about that a little bit later, because we are hoping to have a little bit longer. Um, so the structure for this call, well, the origins of this call, one week ago exactly, um, I was hosting a call, I call them impact calls, gathering people once a month to have conversations about things which are affecting all of us. Um, and in the breakout room, um, I send people to breakout rooms to have discussions. And Rose Chalice, who's on this call, and Sue Barker were in a breakout room. They came back and said, actually, we think that it's too important not to have a more in-depth conversation about the Charities Amendment Bill. What is going on? What does it cover? And so I said, sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. So we thought, I don't know, I was thinking maybe 20 people, maybe 30 people, but actually there's been um, more than 220 have signed up. And then I know many people are listening to this as a recording afterwards. So welcome everyone. Um, it's great to have an engaged group like all of you are. You care enough to spend a bit of time upskilling and learning about what's going on when it comes to these changes. So really briefly, um, the structure for this call is I am going to be um, passing over after this welcome to Sue Barker, um, and we're lucky to have her sharing with us some of the context, a little bit of the history, and some perspectives that she's going to be bringing. Um, and then rather than it being, uh, you know, just us talking in long, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, we thought it would be much more engaging if we have a back and forth dialogue. So what we're going to be doing is using the explanatory note to the bill as our guide, and that outlines what are the key changes. And so Sue and I are going to have a conversation rather than a lecture, rather than anything that's like a, you know, pre-written thing. It's going to be a dialogue, an organic conversation. So we hope that that's going to be more engaging and that you will then be empowered to know what are the things that you care about, either for your organization or you might be an advisor. What can you tell your clients are the key things that they should be concerned about. So we hope that that is um, gonna be a really helpful tool to do that. Um, I wanted to say um, as well that Sophie, my colleague is sitting next to me, you can't see her, but she's right here. Um, she just waved and she's putting in the chat links to things. So when Sue and I are talking, we'll try to make sure there's links going to resources or information that will be helpful. So she just put a link to the explanatory bill. So if you could have that up on your screen, it will help later on because we're gonna use that as kind of like our agenda to work through some of the key changes. Um, I have a feeling we're not gonna get through everything, but we'll do our best to cover the key points. There's at least five or six key points we wanna get across. Um, so before I hand over to Sue, I did also wanna say, um, the six weeks timing has been something that some of us have been wondering about. I mean, as of today, I think it's 34 days left to submit. Um, I did reach out to the DIA policy team and full credit to them. They phoned me back within about an hour. So I spoke with one of the senior policy people there um, and, and she gave their perspective, which is that the time frame for submissions is kind of out of their hands. Um, so just remember, um, Charity Services is there as like within DIA, and then DIA policy is different to Charity Services. So DIA policy said it, it's not really up to them how long there is for submissions. That's actually down to Parliament. And so there's a six-month total period. And so the six weeks is what's normal for making submissions. So I did just want to point that out. 
Um, I don't think it's long enough. And what I'd like to do as a takeaway from this call is to commit to drafting a letter to the committee, which will be considering this and get as many of you as are willing to become signatories to the letter to ask for additional time. Because I just don't think for this sector that there's enough time to mobilize, to truly get input and consult and feedback. But I did wanna give that um, perspective on the timing as well. Um, and Sue, maybe you will have some comments in a minute on that too. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Sue. Um, the, the one thing I would say as well, though, is that Sue and I agree on many, many things, but we don't agree on everything. And I think that's really, really helpful and actually very constructive for democracy. So she's going to give her perspective. Like I say, I don't agree with everything. I agree with a lot, but I don't agree with everything. But part of our goal here is to provoke thinking and discussion. So that is healthy and important and vital. <laughs> so um, Sue, you um, can introduce yourself maybe, but I know you have been deep in this for several years, probably more than any of us in the entire country because you've been researching. And in fact, your report, I think, runs to about 600 pages. So I'm gonna hand over to you. Um, we would love to hear a bit of the context and background. And then you and I will have an exchange going through the key changes. Thanks, Sue. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you to you and Perry Field for hosting this webinar. I know a lot goes on behind the scenes. So thank you very much for all your work in that. And thank you to Rose also for brokering uh, today's um, session. So I'm just going to try to share my screen, which always makes me feel a little bit nervous, but hopefully it will work. <laughs> Can you yep, see that it's okay? working. It's working. Yep, perfect. Awesome. All right, Tena Kuta Katoa. Hello, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here today to speak with you about the Charities Amendment Bill. So um, I have about seven slides, which I'm hoping will take about 14 minutes. Um, um, what I'd essentially like to do is to put today's conversation into some context. So to start off with, I wanted to draw your attention to some links. Um, some of you may be aware that for the last two years I've been on sabbatical as the New Zealand Law Foundation International Research Fellow undertaking research into the question, what does a world leading framework of charities law look like? The report from the fellowship is entitled Focus on Purpose and was um, released in April this year making 70 recommendations for charities law reform in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The first of which is that the government transfers its review of the Charities Act to an independent and ideally multidisciplinary body for a proper first principles post-implementation review, taking into account the wider legal framework for charities, including the Charitable Trusts Act, the Trusts Act, and the Incorporated Societies Act. And at the very least, the le any legal framework for charities must extend to issues of concern for the charitable sector, including the definition of charitable purpose, advocacy, agency structure, the wider legal framework and government contracting. The remaining 69 recommendations are really intended as a starter for discussion. And chapter nine of the report includes a draft bill that would amend and restate the Charities Act, really for the purpose of putting the various recommendations into a tangible form in case that's helpful. Uh, as Stephen said, the report is 596 pages long, it's book length, but what I have really tried to do is to set out the facts including extracts from submissions that charities made to the government's review in 2019, and also to set out the law, and basically to invite people to draw their own conclusions as to whether the current framework of charities law is working and how it might be improved. So I've included a link to the report, and if you'd like a summary, Trust Democracy very kindly hosted a webinar about the research, and I've included a link to it there. There's a website de dedicated to the research at charitieslawreform.nz, and there's a facility there to sign up for updates if that might be of interest. I've also included some commentary about the Charities Amendment Bill and the government's review of the Charities Act generally. And if you're interested in updates about charities law, you're very welcome to join either or both of um, the LinkedIn NZ Charity Law Group um, and the Facebook Charities Act Review 2020 page. But can I just say, as Stephen said, I'd like to reiterate the fact that these are just my views. I don't mind if you disagree with me. In fact, I welcome it. Um, I genuinely believe that in a liberal democracy, it is important that we have the discussion, even a robust discussion, because that is how we get better results. So please don't hold back. In terms of the context, I'd like to start with the terrorist attacks that occurred in the United States on 11 September 2001, or 9-11. 
Following the attacks, the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, issued a series of special recommendations focused on terrorist financing. With respect to not-for-profit organisations, recommend eight, recommendation eight urged countries to review the adequacy of their laws, arguing that not-for-profit organisations are particularly vulnerable to being abused for the financing of terrorism. Although one of the terrorist pilots had apparently been funded through a US not-for-profit organisation, there was no evidence that the not-for-profit sector was in any way more likely to be exploited by terrorists than any other sector. However, Recommendation 8 controversially changed government's attitude to independent civil society organisations, casting suspicion on the entire not-for-profit sector and providing a rationale for a shift from benign registration regimes to active regulation. Recommendation 8 led to blood, blunt sector-wide increases in restrictions which badly damaged the relationship and levels of trust between governments and civil society. Ironically, FATF has since acknowledged the negative effects of Recommendation 8 and revised it. It now reflects the need to protect the legitimate activities of not-for-profit organisations and no longer includes the vulnerable wording. The UN Special Rapporteur has also called on states to improve their cooperation with civil society and embrace not-for-profit organisations as indispensable and integral to the solution in the fight against terrorism. However, the damage was done. Following 9-11, there was a wave of charities legislation around the world. There is not necessarily a direct link between 9-11 and this legislation in all cases. For example, I'm not suggesting that China's charity law of 2016 or indeed the, the, the law reforms that Japan undertook in 2006 are a direct uh, link, have a direct link to 9-11. But certainly in the case of New Zealand and also Ireland, it was pressure from the United Nations Security Council following 9-11 that led to specific legislation for charities. FATIP's Recommendation 8 spawned a counter-terrorism nar narrative that led to a decreased tolerance for risk and an explosion of counter-terrorism measures that prioritise security at the expense of democratic norms. This, in turn, has led to an increasing erosion of fundamental human rights, including crackdowns on dissent and a shrinking space for civil society around the world. The net result has been a proliferation of government regulation, largely focusing on the violent symptoms of terrorism and measurable inputs and outputs, rather than focusing on its causes. The overall impact on democracy of these measures has been profoundly negative. The number of democracies backsliding into authoritarianism has doubled in the past decade, exacerbated by restrictive measures adopted in response to the pandemic. According to the 2021 Civicus Monitor, 90% of the world's population, that's nine out of 10 of every people, every person on the planet, is now living in countries rated as closed, repressed or obstructed. Even Australia and much of Europe are rated as narrowed. Add to this forces at work trying to destabilise democracy from within, and this century is becoming a contest between liberal democracy and the forces of autocracy. In terms of charities law, the net effect is that charities legislation and its administration have become increasingly restrictive. Charities law frameworks are increasingly being used as, as a tool for suppression of not-for-profit advocacy. Civil society is operating in an increasingly hostile environment. 21 years on from 9-11, it is timely to ask whether all of this regulation is working. New Zealand is currently taking a very restrictive approach to the regulation of charities, arguably the most restrictive of all comparable jurisdictions. But a restrictive command and, con and control approach is expensive, not only in terms of compliance, administration and litigation costs, but also hidden costs, such as damage to independence, goodwill, trust, confidence in New Zealand's traditionally strong culture of volunteering and levels of social capital. An overly restrictive approach also doesn't work. After 14 years and many millions and millions of dollars of regulation, public trust and confidence in charities has declined. I know that such surveys have their limitations, but the point in my view is that we are never going to regulate our way to public trust and confidence in charities. Research indicates that most public trust and confidence in charities is driven by charities themselves, and in particular by their purposes. It is charities' commitment to their purposes that underpins support for their activities, protects against mission drift, and builds the trust that enables charities to build their unique value to society. We saw during COVID how effective and efficient a trust-based approach can be. 
In my view, a world-leading framework of charities law would focus on charities' purposes, hence the title of the report. But the current framework does not do that. Instead, it focuses on granular assessments or activities in isolation from the purposes of and furtherance of which they are carried out. This leads to inherent subjectivity and complexity to the point that, in my view, we are now over-regulating charities. And this is undermining charities and causing people, particularly young people, to turn away from charities and choose other modes of social action. The bill, in my view, does nothing to address this issue and, in fact, will make the issue worse. Because there is an underlying clash of paradigms that permeates this area of law. Broadly, one paradigm sees the tax privileges for charities as a subsidy, more or less equivalent to a direct grant. On that basis, decisions to award such a subsidy it can be based on government perceptions as to what is worthwhile subsidising out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund, rather than whether the thing itself is of public benefit. As such, charitable funds come to be seen as government funds, and charities come to be perceived and regulated as though they are merely underfunded service delivery arms of the state. Interestingly, this is, I understand, the policy of the Chinese Communist Party in relation to its 2016 charity law, a policy which Mark Sedell describes as more third sector and less civil society. This approach is based on a view of the charitable sector as purely service oriented, with a role limited to taking over social services from government or contracting with government to provide services. However, such a limited conception of charities comes at a cost. Combined with a Hunger Games contracting environment, such conceptions risk spreading bureaucratic risk aversion and turning charities into pale imitations of the government bureaucracy. It also causes the charity store framework to become focused on restricting tax privileges rather than supporting and enabling the work of charities. The other paradigm does not see the tax privileges for charities as a subsidy, but rather as an investment in an overall system that allows people to manifest important liberal democratic values such as diversity, pluralism, social tolerance and freedom of association in pursuit of public benefit. Under this paradigm, the fact that some individual activities might not be selected for subsidisation by the government of the day is therefore tolerable. Some overbreadth is merely the price we pay for an overall system that contributes significantly to our social cohesion, social capital and well-being. This paradigm sees charities' independence as their hallmark and key to what makes them distinctive and valuable. Charities enable people to come together in furtherance of a shared purpose, untethered by electoral cycles and free from the dictates of the median voter. Charities' independence enables them to take risks, experiment, innovate and reach into communities in ways that governments cannot. This paradigm recognises that charities play an important role in raising public and government awareness of issues, providing an independent voice and valuable flex roots knowledge in the development of social policy. Charities also provide critical balance to the ability of the most economically powerful to dominate and shape policy, thereby providing important protection against the skewing of public policy debates in favour of vested, moneyed interests. Importantly, this paradigm recognises charities' right to mana motahake or self-determination within the bounds of their charitable purpose. The diversity of the charitable sector allows for authentic expressions of pluralism, democratisation and localism as people come together to address issues they see arising in their communities, which issues may not yet be on the radar of government. Many solutions are needed to the complex and connected challenges that we face. Governments cannot solve these challenges alone. Communities know best what communities need. In other words, at the risk of oversimplification, one paradigm seeks to restrict charities and the other seeks to enable their work. The underlying clash of paradigms manifests itself in a number of different ways, including whether the definition of charitable purpose should be interpreted narrowly or widely. Interpreting the definition too narrowly leads to charities being seen as anachronistic, old-fashioned, restricted to providing handouts rather than hand-ups, and therefore forced to wait until people have fallen off a cliff before being able to help them. This in turn perpetuates a de deficits-based capitalist colonialist distinction between haves and have-nots that contributes to charities being seen as symptoms of the problem rather than integral to the solution. Many submitters to the government's review of the Charities Act commented on how there has been a slow moving change of underlying paradigm, particularly since the Charities Commission was disestablished in 2012. 
towards an ever increasingly restrictive approach. And this has primarily been achieved by through con controversially narrow interpretations of the definition of charitable purpose, exacerbated by the fact that decision makers under the Charities Act are not sufficiently distanced from government to be able to um, confirm independent decision making, and the fact that there is a lack of meaningful accountability for decisions made under the Charities Act as currently structured. The bill does not address these issues. In my view, it assumes, without even asking the question, that New Zealand should adopt an ever increasingly restrictive approach. The bill and the government's review of the Charities Act should have been an opportunity to look at some of these issues and actually ask, what are we trying to do with this Charities Act regime and why? As many of you will be aware, we have been waiting almost 20 years for a proper post-implementation review of the Charities Act. It was good news in 2017 when it became Labour Party policy to carry out a first principles review. However, that Labour reneged on this policy on the advice of DIA that was given before any consultation with the charitable sector and instead has carried out a very limited review that excludes from scope almost every issue of concern for the charitable sector. As you know, uh, the review commenced in May 2018, so here we are almost five years later with a bill introduced into the House uh, just over two weeks ago on 21 September. It had its first reading last week and has been referred to the Social Services and Community Select Committee, with submissions closing on 10 November, as Stephen said. The Select Committee is due to report back on 28 March 2023. So it is, even though it's six months, it is a fast process. And, and it is concerning in my view that having taken almost five years to get to this point, they give us just six weeks, now just over four weeks, uh, uh, to make submissions, a time frame that is less than the two-month time frame they recommend in the bill itself. The Minister has said that she might consider looking at more substantive issues later. My concern is that that will not happen. If they were going to do a proper view, review, they would have done it. And my experience as a member of the sector group and the core reference group for the re review of the Charities Act, DIA will consistently advise the Minister very strongly not to carry out a proper review. So this is it. It is very important that charities do make submissions to the Select Committee on this bill because it could be another 20 years or even longer before any of these issues get looked at again. Labor, of course, has a majority on the Select Committee and the Select Committee, of course, will be advised by DIA. DIA, in my view, even though we've been constantly told that there's a distinction between charity services and the policy group, they, um, they are stakeholders in this legislation and have their own view about how the underlying clash of paradigms should be resolved, a review that, in my view, is highly contested. Charities will not have an automatic right of reply to DIA's advice, which will be provided to the Select Committee behind closed doors after submissions have closed. The Select Committee really needs to receive independent advice, in my view, to provide context to DIA's advice. But all of that said, charities have a very good track record of turning unhelpful legislation around at Select Committee stage, and there is an election next year. So please, whatever you do, please make a submission. Wonderful. Thanks, Sue. That's awesome. And, and okay. in the chat, there was some questions. Will you be able to circulate your slides? I assume that will be okay. I'm very happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, thank you for sharing, Sue, because I think sometimes we get caught up in the detail of what's happening right now. And, and we don't really think about the overall historical context. And so I think it's really right that you've framed that in that way. Um, you know, looking at trends on a worldwide scale rather than looking at the detail of, oh, this bill was introduced on this day and we have this long. Um, because I think that that's where the real value comes from. If we can get to the macro level and understand paradigm shifts of thinking. I want to throw one in um, before we get into our conversation about the changes, um, which is I'm seeing quite a lot of interest from for-profit companies in actually integrating in what we would traditionally say would be charitable concepts within their own work. And you see that through the rise of benefit corporations, impact investing, and other things. So I think that's another paradigm of shift that's happening where entrepreneurs that I'm helping to set up are asking, well, we want to enshrine our mission and our purpose within what we do. But that's a topic for another day. Um, so what we would love to do now is have this conversation because 
where whatever we think in terms of um you know should there be a different process should it all change the reality is that we are dealing with a system which is now the wheels are turning <laughs> and we have a relatively limited amount of time to prepare submissions so for an, another um couple minutes in this call what we'd love to do is run through looking at the explanatory note to the bill um, and have a dialogue back and forth just about because we're both lawyers we're kind of in the depths of this we're both assisting clients with charitable initiatives so what are our impressions and where do we think charities should be focusing when it comes to preparing submissions um, I'm actually going to break my own rule about going through the explanatory note because one really st stood out to me, and I'm curious what you think, Sue, which is the definition of officers and the fact that it seems to be quite expanded. Um, and I just wonder, I think this might be one that charities should submit on because it feels to me like there is um, a misunderstanding between what is governance and what is management. And I do quite a bit of work with the IOD who, who are helping raise governance standards across the country. And one of the things I worry about is that those governance standards in charities also need improving. But I think when I read this, what they're saying here is that if you are involved in a charity, um, and I'll, I'll get the wording, the definition is officer means a person who is able to exercise significant influence over the management or administration of the entity. So I guess the, the point here is that it's it's quite an expanded potential definition. Um, and I have concerns about that because I think that it's gonna be difficult to say who's in and who's out. Um, any first reactions on that particular issue, Sue? Absolutely. I mean, to my mind, this is an example of how the Charities Act is so full of unintended consequences and why we really need to look at um, first principles rather than what I see is compounding error upon error. And if you have a look at Chapter 8 of the Focus and Purpose Report, I've gone into the history of how we got to this definition of officer that we've got on the current Charities Act. And it was all very accidental. It was originally, it really was limited to the governing body of the charity. But after submissions had closed, after the select committee had reported by supplementary order paper, there was a, a um, push by um, large churches that have synods comprised of many hundreds of people saying, well, we don't have a governing body. We've got these hundreds of people. We can't possibly certify that all of these people are, are qualified to be officers of a charity. So they made an exception uh, at that very late stage for, um, which was intended to be for synods. And so that's where we got the significant influence wording. And it was only for societies because these weren't trusts. And then they changed it and it's all had this accidental compounding over the 20 years since. And then it was, it was imported into the Incorporated Societies Act. So we've incorporated that mistake into the Incorporated Societies Act. And now we're saying, well, they've done it there so we should do it in the Charities Act as well. So we're getting this absolute conflation of governance and management on the basis of a series of accidental errors um, and I think it will be very difficult for anyone to know, you know, exactly where that line is to be drawn. And I definitely think that's something we should push back on. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. So there you go, everyone listening. That's at least one thing that we, you may want to prepare a submission on. Um, I should say as well that preparing a submission isn't that difficult. Um, I know it might psychologically seem like, oh, no, I've got to open this document. It's got to be 50 pages or something. But actually, um, you can just have very short comments and get right to the issue that matters to you. Um, Sophie's going to post in the chat uh, article we just did on how to make a submission where it needs to go to. So just be encouraged. It, it's actually not as difficult as you might think. Um, so, Sue, so I'd love to turn back to the explanatory note. So for everybody, um, that's uh, we put it in the, the chat. It's basically the start of the bill has a very um, short little run through of what the changes are. The first one that's highlighted there is financial reporting requirements for very small charities. Um, you know, like you, so I'm sure we've got clients who are these very small charities who are operating on the sniff of an oily rag. There's two, three people volunteering. There's not much capacity. Um, so I think the intention here is a good one in that there's going to be the ability to not require the same level of reporting as larger charities. Um, but what's your first reaction to that? 
Well, certainly um, my colleague Dave Henderson and I were, with the support of 12 philanthropic trusts, we were able to attend and speak and listen at, at between us all 27 of the community engagement meetings that were held around the country in 2019. And financial reporting for small charities was definitely a key concern. Um, and I know that a lot of charities are struggling and they, the, the compliance is dropping. So less and less tier four charities are actually complying. So I, I agree there's an issue, but personally I think the um, work of the external reporting board, they're doing a lot of work to considerably simplify the, the reporting for very small charities, including I think they're looking at potentially creating a tier five for, for micro charities that would be very simple. And in my view, that, that whole idea that every registered charity is subject to the requirement to report in accordance with the XRB standards, I think that's a that's actually a helpful rule. But again, it comes down to the un underlying clash of paradigms. So if you, see the, if you see the act as about regulating charities, that's different to whether you see it as about account. I see it as accountability rather than, rather than regulation. So if we're looking at enabling charities, in my view, the quid pro quo for registered charitable status is this requirement to report this information on the charities register and have it made available. So it's about accountability, not, re not regulation. But um, the information on the charities register is perpetually out of date. And um, Charity Services has never used any of its powers about, um, uh, uh, in terms of notifying changes. Um, they've never, there's an administrative penalty that can be opposed. It's never been used. So it, that again comes down to the underlying clash of paradigms. But, um, you know, the financial reporting for small charities, uh, I do have concerns about an exemption. Um, I know they're going to do it by regulation, and I think the regulations will wait until the XRB um, have finished. But, um, you know, I accept that it's a real concern for a lot of small charities. So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. It's good. I actually think some people um, are joining, they're on the XRB or involved in XRB are, are on the call here. So um, if they are, they, I'm sure they're taking notes. And I'm helping out a little bit on their advisory panel. So I'm going to make sure that we highlight this and and let them know um, about this as well. And again, what we're trying to do here is provoke you to dive deeper so that you can make your own mind up about these things. Um, you might say, well, actually the, the level of exemption should be this amount or that amount. And that's helpful because that's real data for the committee to have and be able to use. So I also wanna acknowledge there's lots of comments coming in the chat. Thank you for those. Um, it's really helpful to see what you're thinking and and um, some agreement, disagreement, you know, that type of thing. So Sue, the, the second big picture, um, the big picture item is regulatory decision-making. Um, I would love to find out about your, it, it kind of, it, it all blends a little bit. There's a changes to the appeals framework as well. Um, I might just get you to outline your thoughts and then I'll weigh in with my thoughts on what do we think about these um, regulatory decision-making powers? Well, I'm very concerned about the statement that they are expanding the decisions that are able to be appealed, because in my view, by allowing only four decisions of charity services to be appealed, that is a significant restriction. Because when the Charities Act was originally passed, charities were able to appeal all decisions um, made under the Charities Act. Now, there is a lot of uncertainty about whether um, charities' appeal rights were um, removed um, in 2012 when the Charities Commission was disestablished. And I do actually go into the detail of what happened in Chapter 6 of the report, if that's of interest, so people can draw their own conclusions. But the net effect is, I think um, the DIA tried to remove the vast bulk of charities' uh, rights of appeal, but the question is whether they actually did. But... This, this um, DIA is assuming that they did. They're just, not, they're just not even looking at all that went on. And quite a few of us made submissions in 2016 when they tried to clarify the um, confusion and they failed. We fought back and they weren't able to clarify that charities' rights of appeal had been removed. So we've got this uncertainty that hasn't been resolved. So I, I think... Um, Whatever happens, charities should be able to appeal every decision under the Charities Act because the charities, charity services or whatever agency administers the Charities Act is the registrar of the Charities Register. And if you look at all comparable registration regimes, such as the Companies Act, the Building and Societies Act, uh, the Friendly Societies Act, you know, the Incorporated Societies Act, 
So registered entities are always able to appeal all decisions because, you know, you never know in advance what type of decisions are going to be made and they're all going to have a significant impact. So I really strongly feel we should push back, you know, very strongly on this idea that charities can only appeal for decisions made by charity services. You know, why should charity services be able to make decisions with impunity that can't even be objected to, let alone appealed? You know, they're talking about wanting to make decision making meaningful, you know, meaningful accountability. Well, that's not going to happen if there's just no redress. <laughs> I, I think that's, a, you know, I'm very concerned about that issue. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. And again, this is these are we're raising the issues so that you can look at it and then decide what your organization might um, submit. Um, I noted in the in the chat somebody had a helpful comment, which is that it's not helpful to just have the same submission that is copy pasted, copy pasted. It helps to send your own submission. So if we can encourage you, different organizations, like don't just copy paste what somebody else has done. Actually, spend a bit of time, make it bespoke, and get it in there. Um, so yeah, again, thanks for all these chat comments. And tell me um, your views. This I, I was kind of you know interested that the taxation review authority is going to get involved. Um, so currently, it's the high court. That gets involved, but this is the taxation review authority. The justification in the explanatory statement is that it seems to be, well, charities traditionally were involved with the IRD and therefore were going back to its rightful place. But it strikes me as not quite being um, accurate in terms of where would be the best place. Um, Sue, do you mind um, commenting on that? And maybe as well, we can touch on the role of the board. And I'm aware not everybody on the call will realize sort of what the board is as well. Um, would you like to share about that? Yes, in the report, I recommended that New Zealand establish a specialist charities tribunal. And I think it should hear not only decisions under the Charities Act, but also under other legislation that affects charities, such as the Trusts Act, the Charitable Trusts Act, and the Incorporated Societies Act. And we could have a specialist tribunal that builds expertise in this area um, I agree that the High Court is, um, uh, sets the bar very high and that particularly with the 20 working day time frame, which they are looking at fixing, um, a requirement to go to the High Court has really caused access to justice for charities. But I don't think we should remove that option. Um, currently, if you're a taxpayer and the position that um, existed before the Charities Act was that charities had a choice. You could either go to the Taxation Review Authority or the High Court. Because, now this is kind of pointy-headed, but you only get two bites at the cherry. So if you want to go to the Supreme Court, you're going to have to start at the High Court. But if you're happy, if it's a more factual issue, you might want to go to the TRA where it's lower cost, it's more relaxed, and you can have a, an oral hearing of evidence uh, and, and sort out the factual issue, and you might not want to go to the, the Supreme Court. But you can go to the Court of Appeal. You get two appeals. So by removing the ability to go to the High Court, um, and, well, what they do in the bill is they require you to apply to the Taxation Review Authority if you want to start at the High Court. So that just creates a whole other layer of um, cost and delay while you have to apply. Uh, prior to the Charities Act, charities had the choice, so they could make their own decision where they wanted to start. And if a charity is filing concurrent ju judicial review proceedings, which often happens, uh, Greenpeace did that, the Foundation for Anti-Aging Research did that, often there's both, both a procedural and a substantive issue, you're going to have to file in two courts. You'll have to file in the High Court for the Judicial Review and file your substantive issue in the Taxation Review Authority. So I really think it's very important that we reinstate that choice. And, and that's also, I discussed that in Chapter 6 of the report as well, that I go into a lot of detail about how other jurisdictions do it and why I think that's, um, that would be a good choice to preserve. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thank you. And I saw the comment from Peter in the chat. So just... Um, what we're doing is working our way through the explanatory statement. So I will try to guide you to what we're talking about. We've done the first one, which was financial report, reporting requirements for small charities. Then we looked at the regulatory decision-making. And then we've just been talking about appeals framework and it, the paragraph starting, the bill empowers the taxation review authority. Um, so yeah, it, it's interesting, isn't it, Sue? Because it, someone else in the chat has, has commented, it kind of shows the... Uh, the paradigm of thinking <laughs> that that government would say, well, this is really a matter for the taxation review authority to deal with. You know, it, it, it does yeah. hints at the way that charities maybe are being thought about. 
Yeah, I agree with that. And in the report, I um, because during the process with the core reference group, we were told in no uncertain terms that they were not going to establish a new tribunal. <laughs> and so I, as an alternative option in the report, I also recommended the Taxation Review Authority, basically on the basis that it's a lower level authority, it's more relaxed, it travels, so it can come to you effectively. And because it's the, it's, you know, there aren't many options. I mean, we don't want the ACC or the Customs Appeals or, you know, the District Court. So we don't have a lot of options. And I do think that um, really it will depend on who is appointed as the authority. And if, or hopefully we'd have more than one authority. Most countries have a panel, but the authority in, in, in New Zealand normally works as one person. But it really it would be good to have more than one. But um, it will depend on how it works. And if we d get someone with a deep understanding of trust law, a deep understanding of charities law, they might develop a real specialist expertise and it could become a very valuable resource. But a lot of what I've learned about charities law through this research process is that it's, you can make the law however you like, but it really often depends on how, who's implementing it and how it's working on the ground. Yeah. yeah. No, that's really good. Now, the uh, another point that's related to this, um, going back a little to the, up that page, is that there is this body, Terata Atafai, the Independent Charities Registration Board. So right now, there's three members of that. Um, and, and from my perspective, the way I've seen it work is that charity services will review this, you know, they'll review the case or the, the situation, if somebody's applied or about to be deregistered or something, they'll prepare the pack of information, which then goes to the charities registration board, which then makes the decision. And then it goes back to charity services. The proposal is that that increases from three people to five people. Um, and the, the, the reason that's given here is that that will increase diversity of backgrounds, um, address potential quorum and also conflict of interest issues. Um, uh, what's your take on that? I mean, I think that's probably a good thing because there would be more people involved, but you might have a comment on the board itself. <laughs> well, in my view, this really demonstrates why we need a first principles re review and why we need it to be carried out independently of the DIA. Because, um, the, you know, if we, uh, as I was talking about in the, in the uh, initial comments, the independence of charities is critical to what makes them distinctive and valuable. We must take care to protect the independence of charities or we'll lose what makes them distinctive and valuable. And that's why they inserted the Independent Charities Registration Board when they disestablished the Charities Commission. Because those of you who were around, you know, there was a good 20 years of research went into establishing a Charities Commission in the first place. And it was a hot issue about its independence. And all of that independence was lost when it was moved into a government department, the De uh, Department of Internal Affairs. So the, the, Ch the Charities Registration Board is intended to be uh, the, the mechanism by which we preserve the independence of decision making. But the difficulty is, with the structure as it works, is that the board is not sufficiently distanced from charity services. Charity services writes the reports, it makes most of the decisions. So what we effectively have is decision making about the scope of charity in New Zealand being made by a government department. Um, and I do think that is really undermining charities and their status in society in New Zealand. We really need an independent body making these decisions. And I don't think the board is able to be the independent check on decision making that was intended. And that's no, no fault of the board. It's the way that the system has been set up. No other jurisdiction uses this structure. Most jurisdictions have an independent body or else they have the tax authority. And we removed it from the tax authority, but now we've put it into the DIA. And now we've got this very restrictive approach that, that in my view is undermining charity. So personally, I don't think it's worth putting more money into a structure that isn't working. We'd be much better to actually, you know, and this was a key issue that came through in submissions. Um, we need an independent agency, an independent crown entity making decisions about charities. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sue. So I'm just c conscious of time and wanting to cover off a couple more key points for people. So if we turned over the page, um, there's a section called requirements for officers and governance of charities. I know we're jumping around a little bit here, but there was one that stuck out to me that I would love your thoughts on, Sue. And I'm just not sure if it's hitting the right balance here. It is that the bill requires charities to review their rules, document or governance procedures annually. So I, I wanna say that I totally understand the 
heart behind why this is put here, because I cannot tell you how many times I've talked with charities and no one has looked at their rules for 25 years. Everyone has forgotten what their purposes are, or they have not updated their rules to reflect how they actually operate. You know, they, they, they're, they've got these rules from 1972, and actually they operate in a completely different way, very different to their actual rules. So I understand the desire here that we want to refresh and, and check our documents, but I'm just not sure if this is going to do it. And it's a little bit unclear to me what the consequences would be as well. Like, what do you do? Do you tick a box that says, yes, we reviewed our rules? Um, so maybe that will come out in regulation, but that's just my first impression. Any thoughts from you, Sue? Yes, I, I am very concerned about this provision. And, you know, um, this provision was not consulted on at all. It was not in the DIA's discussion document. It was not in any of the policy papers that were circulated for targeted consultation uh, last year. It was, it was done after consultation had closed. The DIA policy group had a discussion with charity services and they decided to put this in. So there has been no consultation on this provision. And what really concerns me is that it seems to overlook <laughs> the vast body of trust law that already exists. Charities already have duties, no matter how they are structured, even if they're unincorporated, they already have duties to know their rules and to comply with them. So um, I think creating this new, this new requirement which, which to review your rules, and my understanding from the regulatory impact statement is that um, they're going to require charities to tick in the annual return that they've done that. And if they don't do it for two years in a row, they'll be deregistered. And I really do think this is an example of regulatory overreach. It's not for the state to tell charities to review their rules. It's for the state to enforce the law that already exists. So that's why in, the, in Chapter 2 of the report, and this is really the key kind of um, focus on purpose thing, I think we should articulate in the Charities Act that all charities and all people that govern them have a duty to act in good faith to further the, the stated charitable purposes of the entity in accordance with its rules. If we put that in the Act, then it will all be clear, because it's currently in, in various different pieces of legislation, and for unincorporated um, charities, it might not be that clear, but they must all have rules, and I'm sure a court would require them to comply with them. So um, I think we're going in the wrong direction. It's going to create unnecessary and increased complexity, and it will cut across the underlying law. And I just, <laughs> I just wish they wouldn't do it. <laughs> so you don't like that one. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm just um, thinking through as well. In a way, you know, we're talking a bit about paradigms, and I realize that for some people, they thought they were going to be just hearing about this section and this section. And but I think it's important to step back and remember those paradigms. And one of the paradigms I'm concerned about is that charities fundamentally have received their money through donations from private individuals who believe enough in the cause to give the money to that thing, which is advancing education, reduction of poverty, you know, advancing religion, purpose is beneficial to the community. So there is, a, in a way, a a relationship between the original donors and the charity that exists. And some of these rules seem to be trying to come in and then regulate what happens with those funds which were given for that purpose. So that's where I start, you know, that's a truly a almost a philosophical point, which is what's the role of government in our society versus how do charities relate with their donors? Um, I noticed Wayne put a comment in the chat as well that some some charities probably can't amend their rules. <laughs> and I've definitely seen a few of those where you look at it and it blessed their hearts in 1932 when they wrote it, it made perfect sense, but there is no amendment clause. It's very hard to understand what was intended. Um, so that can be an issue as well. Um, so I, I, this leads me to another point that I'd love to get your input on, and that is um, thinking about larger charities. So we've been kind of focusing on the smaller ones. It's not in the act here, but there is uh, probably going to be required more in policy or regulation. This requirement that larger charities explain what they do 
with their assets. So to me, this is a fundamental point that people need to understand um, because it's, again, a philosophical perspective. But if a charity has assets, has funds, in the future through the annual return requirements, it may need to be explaining how it's going to be using those to advance the charitable purpose. And that, to me, is a fundamental shift from what we've had in the past. Do you want to riff off of that as well? I know you've got views. <laughs> riff off, it sounds like a rap video. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I mean, I have concerns about that as well because um, the XRB and the financial reporting standards requires charities to disclose the nature and purpose of their reserves. But if they haven't transferred their accumulated funds to a reserve, it will be sitting there as a big kind of often a big number of accumulated funds, and they may not be, um, and, and it may not be clear uh, how that's uh, going to be used to further their charitable purposes. But I think there are a lot of assumptions that have gone into this requirement for them to disclose the reason for their accumulated funds in their annual return, um, and I, they're. You know, I, I could go into them. I've written about this quite a bit, but what really concerns me about this requirement, and, and in my experience, charities are always perfectly happy to be transparent. They're not. There's no problem with transparency. But what where this is really going, I think, is to gather data on charities' accumulated funds to use uh, to ultimately um, remove charities exemption from income tax for business income and I'm reading between the lines in the tax working group report I don't have a crystal ball but my take on it is that they are looking to remove charities exemption from business uh, from income tax for business income potentially as a precursor to removing the exemption from income tax for all income for charities so you know the the approach is quite hostile for charities and I'm very concerned about where things are going thank you Sue that's great um, well I'm just conscious of time and thinking there there's one there that was interesting the bill requires at least one officer of a charity to be 18 years or old or over um, they say this change will create legislative consistency uh, the remaining officers of a charity can be 16 or 17 years of age to allow young people to continue to contribute uh, any first reactions to that change I mean, I don't have a strong view on this one, but according to the regulatory impact statement, there is not one single charity that does not already have an officer who is at least 18 years. So I really don't, you know, when, when there's so much, you know, when we're facing catastrophic climate change, you know, when there's so many intractable issues, I really can't see the point in making this change. But, you know, <laughs> um, and I don't think there is, I mean, I think I might differ from your view on this, but I actually don't think there is inconsistency between the Trust Act and the Companies Act. The Trust Act and Companies Act require trustees and directors to be 18 years old. I don't think the Charities Act overrides that, but, you know, and I don't really see that this is going to clarify that. But personally, I wish they would spend their resources on more important things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sue. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, we're getting some nice comments in the chat as well from Peter and, and others. Um, you know, talking about what's coming, right? What What is it setting the scene for? Go ahead, yeah. Sue. Can I just ask a question? Because I, I haven't really been monitoring the chat. Can we save it? And perhaps we can respond to people afterwards? Because I, yeah, I haven't seen it. Yeah, yeah, great. because I'm recording it, all of the chat will be saved. So we'll be able to, why not, I'll, after this, I can send it to you. Um, which kind of leads us nicely to where we're at. Um, I'm really conscious of everybody's time. We value your time. We were not trying to do a comprehensive review of the entire um, bill, um, although it isn't that long. Like it doesn't take that long to just sit there um, and read it cold and think for yourself. What we're trying to do by hosting this call is to provoke you to go and have a look and decide for yourself what is best for our organization. And we really encourage you then to be part of the democratic process, put your thoughts forward, put them in. So there's some takeaways from this call um, is number one, um, we're gonna be working on a letter to the select committee. Um, when I spoke with the DIA policy person, she thought that they hadn't actually met yet to consider this. So I think the letter is gonna say that we think more time it would be very helpful and beneficial. So if you're uh, supportive of that kaupapa, if you like that purpose, um, then we have emails now based on joining this call. We'll send a draft around. Um, Sue, you, you and I can work on that, I'm sure. 
Um, and then we would love to go to the committee and say, hey, look at this. We've got a hundred and who, however many, maybe more, <laughs> but lots of people behind that. Um, so that's the first thing. That's the tangible next step. Um, the other one is, um, so next Friday is the Charity Services Annual General Meeting. So you can log in, you can watch that, you can ask questions. This is again a chance to make our voices heard. Um, obviously, it's a little bit different because the bill is being considered now, but it still is an avenue to to make our voices um, be um, be heard. Um, and then the other thing is that I've been recording this, so as soon as we finish recording, I'm going to go and quickly edit it, save it, and then make it into an episode of a, a labor of love that I have called Seeds Podcast, where I've interviewed more than 325 inspiring Kiwis about their lives and journeys. And I think this, this will become a great episode there. So I'm going to do that so that I will send it this afternoon, probably as quickly as possible after this call. So watch your inbox. Um, and th the point of that is that if this has been helpful, then you can share it with others to get them thinking as well. Like that's what we need. We need more people thinking about the issues. So that will come in an email that comes around um, this afternoon. Um, then the other, the, the, the final, final thing is that um, we do want to continue to have engagement on this. So Sue, I think you're probably open to it as well. We'll look at all the questions in the chat and we will, I'm making a commitment here. I hope it's okay, Sue. We will endeavor to answer or provide some comment about every question that's come in the chat. And we'll probably do that in a Word document or something and just copy paste and then put some answers um, because we value your input and your questions matter. And that in turn can help to inform submissions as well. So um, yeah, we hope that this has been really helpful. Um, that is the, the heart, the kaupapa behind it. Um, we, we want you to be empowered to go away from this call and hopefully now engage with your stakeholders, your boards, your members, and have some discussions and then put forward submissions so that we can make our voice heard. So I'm gonna hit um, stop, pause on recording, but I want to say thank you all for coming to this and thank you to everybody who's listening now as well.